all right I think we are on time and we should be uh, good to go so let's uh, hi everyone and let's uh, go to the slides there we go all right uh, Hi everyone, uh, my name is Martin Brown. I'm a software engineer uh, at Skyscanner and today I will show you uh, how you can decompile uh, Kotlin code which lets you uh, understand Kotlin features uh, in a more in-depth way and it can also help you solve bugs and uh, improve the performance of your applications if you uh, go into debugging the bytecode. So throughout all of this talk uh, we're going to be uh, looking at this single function uh, which will multiply a string with an int uh, meaning that if we were to run it for the inputs that you can see on the slide right here uh, we would expect to get hello 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 out of it so this is what I mean by uh, multiplying a string and if you're writing code like this in IntelliJ IDEA or in Android Studio then uh, you can look at the bytecode that's being generated from your Kotlin sources uh, by the compiler which you can do by going through either the tools menu Kotlin and then show Kotlin bytecode or you can uh, do an action search in your IDE and uh, type in show Kotlin bytecode or some subset of that and invoke the same action which is sometimes uh, more convenient so either way you would end up with this panel which is by default on the right hand side of your IDE and it shows you the bytecode that corresponds to the uh, current Kotlin source file that you have open so if you uh, navigate uh, to a given line in your source file uh, you actually get the corresponding piece of the bytecode highlighted on the uh, panel on the right uh, which lets you uh, zero in on uh, what piece of the bytecode uh, was compiled from uh, what piece of your original Kotlin sources and you can figure out a couple things by looking at the bytecode here even if you've never looked at bytecode before you can see what types are being used and what methods are being invoked on them but it's kind of difficult to trace instances of things and what uh, objects are being passed in as parameters and things like that so to make that easier thankfully uh, we have a decompile button uh, right up there at the very top of this panel and by hitting that uh, you will find yourself in a new file which is a Java source file and this Java file is generated uh, by decompiling the bytecode uh, that was first created from uh, your Kotlin uh, sources being compiled so the, the decompiler that's bundled with the Kotlin plugin is pretending that the bytecode was a result of compiling Java code and it tries to figure out what the original Java code could have looked like if it resulted in uh, this bytecode being generated. So if we look at the bytecode or the decompiled uh, Java code uh, that we uh, got from the decompiler, uh, we can see that, that our top level main function is now wrapped in a class because in Java and also at the bytecode level, functions can't exist outside of classes like they uh, did in Kotlin. So everything gets wrapped in a class. Um, and then inside it, we do have our main function and it does roughly what you would expect it to do so it calls the multiply function and then it prints the result that it got back from there but not before uh, creating this uh, completely useless uh, boolean assigning a value to it and then never using it again so this is a good time to point out that the decompiler will not always be perfect you will find weird things in the output of uh, decompiling bytecode and most of the time the Java source file you get uh, wouldn't compile as is you would have to fix some things in there uh, but it's still a very good approximation of what's happening in the bytecode and it's much easier to understand for us so this is the uh, loop that I will uh, go over and over and over again uh, so we're gonna go from a Kotlin source file uh, down to the uh, bytecode which is a class file and then we're gonna decompile that into a Java source file using this decompiler most of the time and I'm mostly gonna be skipping the middle step so uh, we're not gonna look at the bytecode but instead we're just going to go from Kotlin straight to Java but remember that this is the loop uh, that I'm going through and uh, that's how I'm getting from Kotlin to Java code uh, that's the translation mechanism between those so uh, getting back to this function that I want to use as our example uh, 
I usually ask the audience if they feel like they could implement a function like this and the answer is always a very overwhelming yes so I'm going to skip that now uh, because it would be more difficult to do than usual and I'm gonna go ahead and start implementing this method myself so what I will do first is I'll go with a very uh, trivial uh, naive implementation and then we're going to iterate on that and keep improving it so the way I'll do this is I'll create a variable for an empty string at first, then I'm going to loop for the given number of times. Inside the loop, I will keep appending the input string to my uh, variable, and then at the end of the function, I'll just return whatever I have collected inside um, that variable. So we can now start decompiling, and if we decompile this version of the multiply function, uh, we will get uh, this uh, Java source back. And we're going to go through this uh, line by line since it's our first decompiled code and uh, check out a couple of things in here. So let's start with the uh, signature of the function, the header of the function. First of all, we have this uh, string return type, which in Kotlin we have declared as a non-nullable string. So in the bytecode, we ended up with a not null annotation that indicates this. Uh, and very similarly, the first parameter of our function was non-nullable as well, so this is also annotated. Uh, this annotation will be used by any Kotlin code calling into this code uh, to um, ensure that no one passes in a potentially null value. And as for uh, Java code uh, invoking multiply, uh, you will get a warning about this, hopefully, depending on your uh, compiler setup and your IDE but it will not prevent uh, Java code from passing in null values for this first parameter, unfortunately, because Java doesn't enforce uh, nullability as strongly as Kotlin does. Then moving on to the second parameter, uh, this has the type of int in the uh, Kotlin source, and this is an interesting piece uh, because in Kotlin we only have a single int type, while in Java we have a lowercase int, which is a primitive, and an uppercase int, uh, which is a reference type, a boxed integer type. And the way that the compiler solves uh, this is that whenever it can, it will use the primitive type, uh, such as in this case, uh, which is more performant. But if we were to do something uh, like this, for example, so if we change the uh, type of our function parameter to a nullable int in Kotlin, then the compiler would have no choice uh, but to make this a reference type in the bytecode and then annotate it accordingly, of course, uh, because this is the type that can actually hold a null value, uh, which the primitive uh, int could not. All right, so going back to the first parameter for one more second, uh, there is this first line inside the decompiled version of the bytecode, which doesn't really correspond to anything that we have written into the body of our function ourselves, but this line uh, actually still belongs to the parameter uh, that we already discussed. So there is a runtime null check injected here by the Kotlin compiler. And this null check ensures that if somehow a null value was passed in here, uh, despite the annotation on the parameter, uh, we will not start executing the method and fill in some very um, unexpected way, but instead uh, stop executing straight away uh, at the very beginning and just crash the application or at least the method call. So we can go ahead and navigate into this check. Uh, so this intrinsics class that is being used here is a part of the Kotlin runtime. So we can navigate to it in our IDE. And we will see that this uh, check parameter is not null function is really just that, a simple null check. And if that check fails, then uh, we would see the uh, next method in this class being invoked, which generates the exception to be thrown. And you can see here uh, from all the string concatenation inside this function that it gives you a very uh, well-worded exception message. So it tells you that there was a problem with the parameter being null. And it also tells you the exact class and method that this happened in, which is very neat. Moving on, in the rest of the body, we will see expected things. So there is the variable being declared and then returned at the very end of the function. And then there's the for loop uh, right there in the middle, uh, which um, keeps concatenating the input to the uh, temporary variable that we have. The indices here, uh, the way that are be they are being used, it's slightly odd. It's not what you would write by hand in Java, but uh, they do what you expect them to do. And uh, that's what really matters. So with that discussed, we're gonna move on and start iterating on our multiply function. 
And the first change that I'm going to make is that I'm going to make this function an extension on the string type. So I'm going to take the first parameter, which was a string that we were passing in as a regular function parameter, and move it out to the receiver uh, position, making this an extension on string. So if we go through a decompile cycle once again, then this is the change that we would see in the output. So all that really changes in our function at the bytecode level is the name of that first parameter, uh, which immediately tells us a lot of things. So for example, we now know that just like top level functions, which um, become static functions at the bytecode level, extension functions, if they are top level, are also simply uh, static functions. And their receivers uh, become uh, parameters of the uh, function, so uh, they end up at the very first uh, index as a parameter, and everything else is kind of just shifted over by one. Uh, we also see that the uh, parameter has a um, useful name, uh, which is dollar uh, sign this dollar sign multiply, and this name indicates that it's a receiver at the multiply functions scope everything else um, remained the same. You also might have noticed that the code no longer fits on the slides. So I'm going to start uh, formatting uh, this function like this, uh, slightly unconventionally, uh, just because Java has so many keywords um, in front of its functions. Okay, uh, let's look at something else uh, which results from uh, extension functions being static. And we're going to take an example of a class hierarchy here, a very simple one. So we have an animal class here, which is able to identify itself as an animal by printing a string on the screen. And there is a subclass of this, a cat, which can print this is a cat in its own identify function. And if we create an instance of a cat and store it in a variable which is typed as an animal, then uh, calling identify on it will print this is a cat. Uh, this is the expected behavior for member functions. So um, dynamic dispatch happens at runtime and depending on what kind of animal is inside this uh, variable, the um, concrete um, implementation of identify, depending on the animal type, uh, will be executed. So what happens if we move these two methods into extension functions instead? Uh, something like this. So we have an extension on animal and an extension on cat, which are uh, still printing the same strings. Well, if we run our code again, we will find that the behavior changes. And now we are executing the identify uh, extension that's defined on animal. Uh, the reason why this happens is that, again, identify is a static function. It's two overloaded static functions now. And there is no dynamic dispatch for static functions at runtime. Uh, the correct function to call uh, has to be selected during compilation. And at compile time, all that the compiler knows is that our um, reference is uh, holding some kind of an animal, but it doesn't know a concrete type. So keep in mind that uh, this kind of difference will happen uh, with extensions, and you can't uh, overload or uh, can't uh, override extensions for uh, polymorphic types. Moving on then. Um, there is this line where we are performing string concatenation inside our function. And on this line, if we had this in the IDE, we would get a warning which would tell us to simplify this line and to simplify it uh, like this. So the suggestion would be to use a compound assignment or augmented assignment operator, um, whichever you want to call it. And making this change, uh, it turns out, doesn't change our bytecode whatsoever. So just like we had before in the uh, Java source that we decompiled, we have a Java style uh, plus operator, which uh, concatenates uh, strings together. But this is a good time to talk about how Kotlin's operators are resolved. So for these compound operators, uh, each of them correspond to a given method name. And the compiler will look for these method names on the types that we are trying to execute the operator on. So in the case of the uh, plus equals operator, it would be a method named plus assign, and in our concrete case on the string type. And if it doesn't find these methods, and this method does not exist on string, um, it will unroll these expressions to their longer forms. And these uh, simpler 
um, operators that are used in these expressions will then again be looked up and they have their own method names and this is what happens with string concatenation Kotlin's string type does have a regular plus operator and that's what translates to a Java style um, plus operator call in the bytecode uh, we'll get back to this a bit later on but uh, that's um, enough about this for now alright so we have our multiply function ready and now what I'm going to do is I will start refactoring this and extracting some pieces of functionality out of it. So I will introduce a repeat function here, which is capable of repeating a given uh, action a given number of times. So it takes the number of times as its first parameter, a regular int, and the second parameter will be a function type. And the implementation is simply calling that function over and over again inside a for loop. To use this in multiply, I would have to do this. So I am now passing in the int, and as for the function parameter, I am using a lambda, um, which contains the string concatenation um, expression. Let's decompile the repeat function and see how um, this works. There are a lot of simple things here. There's a for loop, uh, there is a uh, static function being generated, and so on. The interesting part here would be how a function is passed in in Kotlin. So we can see that when we have a function type as a parameter in our Kotlin source, then in the bytecode, that will actually translate to a function zero instance. And whenever we call this function in our, in our Kotlin code, then the invoke method of function zero is what's being executed. So what is this function zero? Let's again, simply navigate to its declaration. Um, function zero turns out to be an interface in the Kotlin runtime and this interface defines only a single method inside it which is called invoke and whenever we pass in a function somewhere uh, that function will be wrapped in an object which implements this interface and it will contain the code of the functions body uh, inside the invoke method of the function interface and this is the interface for functions that take zero arguments however there are also interfaces for functions that do take some parameters so for example with function one uh, you could um, have a single parameter which you can see there uh, in the invoke method and then there's function two and then there's function three and so on and so on and this just basically keeps going for quite a long while uh, all the way up to function 22 uh, which used to be the limit of how many parameters you can have for a function type in Kotlin. Uh, since Kotlin 1.3, this has been raised to 255, which is defined by the JVM as the limit for function parameters. Uh, however, all of those um, functions with a lot of parameters didn't get their own um, functional interfaces in the runtime, but instead something else happens if you compile functions like that, which I encourage you to check out yourself uh, by um, creating a function like that and decompiling that code. All right, so that's how the repeat function works. Uh, that's how it takes a function as a parameter. The other exciting part of this exchange would be seeing how this function is passed in when we call the repeat function inside multiply. So let's decompile the multiply function again, which looks like this. So suddenly the multiply function got a lot more complicated than it was before. Uh, let's see what happened. So there is a call to the re repeat function here and we're passing in an int and we're, we're passing in an implementation of function zero. This is fairly straightforward. We expected this. What you might not have expected is this part. So there is something called an object ref being allocated here. We're storing a empty string inside it. Then we're using this object ref inside the function implementation. And then at the end, we are again grabbing a value out of this reference. Uh, so things are slightly weird here. Um, let's see why we need this and what problem this solves for us. So if we were to write this code ourselves uh, in Java terms, we would do something like this. We would declare an empty string and return that string at the end of the function. And then within the uh, function implementation that we're passing into repeat, we would simply take result, uh, concatenate the receiver to it and reassign its value. So this is a good idea, but it wouldn't compile in Java because uh, we are trying to access a variable from an outer scope inside our uh, nested class. Uh, 
So in order to access a result inside function zero, we would have to make it final because only final variables can be captured in Java. However, if we make this uh, variable final, we can no longer modify its value and update it to newer and newer strings. So we have a problem here where we both need this variable uh, to be final in order to be captured, but we also need it to be uh, mutable because we have to reassign what string instance it points to over and over and over again. Putting this visually for a moment, um, let's say that this is the representation of a non-final uh, reference to a string. And in this case, we could create a new string instance and make the reference point to that new instance. But if we had a final reference to a string, then that will always, uh, for its lifetime, point to the uh, exact same string instance and we can't modify it. So how does the Kotlin compiler solve this for us? Because the code that we have written in uh, Kotlin does actually work. Well, it uh, uses this object ref helper class here, uh, which again, we can uh, check out its implementation very easily by navigating to it. And it turns out that object ref is nothing but a generic wrapper around any arbitrary value. So we can place whatever reference we want inside object ref, and that's all it really does. So how is it being used? Well, we are creating an instance of object ref here, and we're, by the, we're at the beginning of the function, we're placing an empty string in it. Then inside the function, we are capturing the reference that points to our object ref, uh, and this reference is final, so this can be done easily. Then we are taking the string out of the object ref, we are doing the concatenation, and then we are reassigning what the object ref points to internally, because the value that it holds um, inside is actually mutable. And finally, at the end of the function, we are taking whatever uh, value ended up inside object ref and just returning that string. So going back to the visual uh, representation of this, what we're doing is that we are introducing this extra level of abstraction. We have a final reference to object ref and that can be captured, but then inside there we have a mutable reference which we can make um, changes to and we can make it point to newer and newer instances of the string class. So all of this was needed uh, because our function captures a value. That's why this uh, object ref is created and that's why this function zero uh, needs to be uh, allocated every time that we call multiply because we will have a new object ref instance. So we need a new function one instance that will work on this reference. But what if we were using a simpler lambda here? Uh, if we were using uh, re the repeat function for something simpler, for example, if we were just printing a hard-coded string inside it. Uh, so this doesn't have any external dependencies anymore. Let's see how this would uh, decompile. So it turns out that this is what the built-in decompiler would give you uh, if you decompiled this piece of Kotlin code. So you would see a call to the repeat function, which is expected, and there would be the uh, integer 20 passed in as the first parameter. However, where you expect to see some kind of a lambda implementation, some kind of a function zero implementation at the place of the second parameter, you would see null.instance, which seems like something very, very wrong and something that wouldn't work, uh, despite the actual example function, if you run it in Kotlin, working just fine. So this is the point where you would have to go to external tools uh, and a third party decompiler instead of the built-in one. For example, JEDX is a very simple one to use and that's what I usually um, pick first if I uh, need to go beyond what the built-in one can do. And if you were to do that, uh, you would see that what actually happens here is that there is a class generated which implements function zero. And this function uh, zero implementation has the uh, invoke method um, as you expect it to be. So it is printing the hard-coded string that we have. However, what it also has is this um, instance variable. So a variable called instance inside it. And this is a static field and it contains an instance of this same class. So what we're seeing here is basically an implementation of the singleton pattern, uh, which is then used every time uh, that the um, function zero implementation is required. So instead of creating new instances of this class over and over, what happens in the example function is that we are just reading this single instance, this single static instance of this class, uh, 
and we are using that every time that example is called. Uh, this is a very simple optimization that the compiler is doing for us, uh, since it detects that there are no external dependencies uh, for the way that our function works. All right, so going back to our main example, uh, we have discussed uh, what's happening with this object ref and why a function zero is also allocated every time. And we are paying all of these costs in terms of uh, memory and at runtime performance uh, because we have extracted some piece of logic from the multiply function and placed it in another function. So what if we could uh, extract this piece of logic but not pay the price for doing it? What if we didn't have to allocate objects when we are calling the repeat function? and it just worked uh, with the same performance that we had before when we wrote everything in the, inside a single function. Well, uh, this is exactly what the inlining feature of Kotlin does. So if we add the inline keyword to the repeat function, we will suddenly see our performance uh, losses mitigated and we will see um, everything optimized away. Uh, let's see what that actually means. So your first instinct after making a change to the repeat function might be to decompile it and see how it changed but it turns out that the repeat functions uh, implementation doesn't actually change when you make it in line so where you have to go instead is the call site to the multiply function and see how that decompiles now and if you go through a decompile cycle there you will see that the multiply function suddenly looks a lot like our very first implementation of it so instead of having a call to repeat and having all kinds of objects allocated inside it. We simply have a string being created and then we have a for loop and we are returning the string at the very end of the function. So despite us calling the repeat function in our source code, at the bytecode level we have the for loop that's uh, pr produced by the repeat function directly inside multiply. So this kind of inlining happens during compilation on a intermediate uh, form of the source code, so um, somewhere in the middle of compilation. But I will now show you uh, on the source code level what inlining would look like if uh, it happened at the source code level, because this is a lot more visual and easier to understand. So uh, we are just making all of this up, uh, just remember that. So what inlining does is that it will go through each parameter of the function first and substitute those parameters uh, to every place where they are being used inside the function that's being inlined. So for example, the first parameter here is times and it's being fulfilled by a value called times uh, at the call site, at this specific call site of the repeat function. So that would be moved inside the body of the repeat function, something like this. And then the, there is this second parameter called action, which is a function type, and uh, the corresponding value that's being passed in is a lambda at this call site. So that lambda would be moved to each place where it's being used inside the function. And since we are declaring a lambda here and just immediately invoking it, uh, we can optimize that away by just replacing it with the contents of the lambda. And after we have substituted all of the parameters to the function that's being inlined, what we would do is that we would take uh, that body and replace the call to the repeat function altogether uh, with um, this substituted body. So this is how inlining happens in a nutshell. And this is how at the bytecode level we end up with uh, the for loop directly inside multiply. Okay, moving on. Let's take a look at this string concatenation one more time. Uh, we looked at this before. Uh, but now we're going to look at it even closer and this is the only time that we're going to go down to the bytecode level. So if we take a look at the bytecode that's emitted for this line of sor Kotlin source code, what we see is that there is a string builder instance uh, being allocated here. Its constructor is called, that's the init method that you see on the slide. And then we are appending two strings to the string builder and finally we are calling the two string method on it. So every time we uh, loop, uh, every time we go through a loop in the repeat function, we would have the string that we have so far in result, and we would, would have the original input string, and we would need to allocate a string builder instance and copy these two strings inside that string builder 
and when that's done we would call to string on it and make this our uh, result variable for the next iteration and we would again need to allocate a string builder and move these two strings uh, inside it and so on and so on and so on so there is a lot of moving things around a lot of memory allocations happening here for every iteration of the repeat function so can we avoid this well, uh, thankfully we can. Uh, we can just create a single string builder ourselves, which will save us quite a bit of allocations. And this might be what uh, you would have done yourself when uh, originally asked to implement this method in the first place. So the way to do this uh, would be to create a string builder. Then instead of concatenating strings, we would keep calling the append method on string builder. And then finally we would return uh, the value that was uh, built up inside the string builder uh, from the multiply function. Decompiling this we will see a lot of expected things. We will see the uh, string builder constructor being called, uh, append called on it, uh, the string builder, and finally we will see the result uh, from the string builder being returned from the function. However, there is yet again a null check inserted here. So since our Kotlin function promises to return a non-null string as its return value, and since string builder is implemented in Java code, which doesn't make any promises on nullability, the compiler will inject a null check here for the builder.toString expression. And if that expression happens to be null, it will not perform the return, but instead crash with an exception because we would be breaking the contract of our multiply function. And again, you can see that the expression itself, the literal uh, expression in code is being passed into this null check as a string. So you would expect that if this does crash somehow, uh, then we would see builder.toString uh, was null or something like that in the expression message uh, or the, uh, sorry, the exception message. So that would again be uh, quite easy to debug afterwards. All right, uh, we have this string builder usage done. And this pattern of using a string builder, uh, which is allocating one, then calling append on it a bunch of times, and finally extracting the string from it, is a quite common pattern. This is how we use string builders all of the time. And so we can extract this into a function as well. The way we would do this is by creating a function called build string. And this function will create a string builder internally. Uh, and it takes a function as its parameter, uh, which is a extension on the string builder type. So this is the function that will describe what we are doing with the string builder when we are using it. And then at the end of the function, the string builder would be returned. If we want to start using this uh, extension function, or um, if we want to start using this, uh, sorry, if we want to start using this function inside multiply, mm -hmm then the way that we would do that is something like this. So we would call the build string function, then call repeat inside it, and then just keep appending uh, to the string builder. Now we can uh, do this append call without specifying what we are appending to, because inside the braces of the Lambda that we pass into build string, uh, since we are defining an extension for the string builder type, we are writing our code as if we were inside the string builder. So writing down just append uh, is the same as writing down this.append and that will uh, refer to the string builder instance that we are um, that we are uh, invoking this uh, builder action function on. However, um, if we are looking at this, you might spot that I have managed to introduce a bug here. So since I wrote down append this, I am now just appending the string builder to itself over and over again, and I'm never uh, using the input string of the multiply function. So the way to solve this would be to specify which this reference I want to uh, append. So this can be done with a qualifier uh, such as this one, uh, which would uh, make the reference point to the uh, correct string. Um, small side note, if you have to uh, qualify things like this and uh, disambiguate uh, things like this, you might want to reconsider whether you want to nest all of these scopes inside each other. But for our purposes now, um, this is for um, educational purposes, so I'm going to stick with this syntax. All right, so we now have these three methods and we can again look at what multiply looks like uh, with this usage of build string inside it. So decompiling the multiply function, uh, 
we will see that the build string function is being called and we're passing in a function one uh, implementation to it. So the function type that we uh, declared as the parameter of build string is a function that takes no parameters, but it does have a receiver. So that's why we have a function one here and not just a function zero. And we can in fact see that receiver in the uh, parameter list of the invoke method. So we can see that the string builder is being passed in right there. And then inside the implementation, uh, we have yet another uh, null check, which we are very used to by now. And then we have a for loop inside which we are appending one of the receivers to the other. And here the um, well-named uh, receiver names in the bytecode level are very handy for us. So we can see that we are taking the receiver at the build string scope, which is our string builder instance. And we are appending the receiver at the multiply scope, our string instance to it over and over again. All right, so we introduced abstraction. We uh, put some of our implementation into this separate build string function. And this again is costing us uh, because we have to allocate a function one every time that multiply is called. And by now you probably see this coming, but we are also going to inline the build string function uh, just to uh, get our performance back. And if we uh, run through multiply, uh, run multiply through a decompile loop once again, then we would see this final form of the multiply function where it contains the allocation of a string builder, the for loop, and um, all of this implementation directly at the bytecode level. However, at the source level, we now have these three functions that build upon each other and which extract reusable pieces of logic that you can use all over your code base. So with, th with this, we are done implementing uh, our function but I will now tell you that you shouldn't be uh, writing either of these helper functions. Uh, but the only reason why you shouldn't be doing that is because both of these functions are uh, actually part of the Kotlin standard library and they are implemented better than what we've done for ourselves here. Uh, for example, the repeat function um, will give you the current uh, iteration index uh, every time it loops around inside your Lambda and it also supports contracts, uh, which make it uh, usable in more situations. Finally, uh, you might spot that we still have some allocations that we can get rid of, uh, which we can do so by using an overload of the standard library build string function. So this overload takes an extra first parameter, which is an int that will uh, tell the function what size to allocate the internal array inside the string builder that it uses. Um, at the uh, start of the function. So by calculating the exact size of string that we will end up with at the uh, very end of our looping, we can just pre-allocate a string builder with a precise uh, size and that will eliminate all of our um, memory reallocations and copying uh, that would be done otherwise. All right, um, let's wrap this up. So uh, this talk is not a completely original idea because nothing is. So I would like to point you towards some other talks which cover the same topic in case that you uh, want to learn more. Uh, you can of course also go off and uh, discover these things yourself. But if you want more of a um, guided tour, then uh, these should help you. So first there is a talk uh, titled Kotlin Uncovered by Victoria Gonda all the way back from 2017. Uh, this is the first talk that I've seen on this topic. Then there was a talk last year by Jonut Balosin, uh, who uh, talked more about the performance implications of these things. And he also uh, made uh, quite a few benchmarks. So uh, if you're uh, performance conscious, then this is a very good talk to check out. Then there was a talk last year at Google I.O. 19 uh, by Chad Haas and Roman Guy. Uh, which was uh, Kotlin under the hood. They mostly focused on the uh, newer Kotlin features, so things that are in Kotlin 1.3 and maybe something ar about around the uh, coroutines, I think. Uh, so that's definitely worth watching as well. And then they iterated on that talk and gave another talk um, at Kotlin Conf 2019, which also covered uh, similar topics. All right, so if you want to grab these slides, uh, or any of the resources that I've just mentioned, or uh, even more, you can go to my website uh, where you will find all of these things. Uh, and if you're interested, you can also follow me on Twitter. So um, 
you can uh, hopefully already find the link to the slides uh, on my Twitter account. And I also post a lot of similar content. And I don't know if we have much time for questions or if we can uh, go over time with them. But if you have questions and you've posted them in the Slido, then we can hopefully still look at those. And thank you for your time, of course. If I'm on the right page, I think we don't have any questions so far. Hopefully I am. Okay, I think if we don't have any questions, I will uh, stop the talk. And if you have any questions, you can, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me over Slack or Twitter or wherever you want to. Uh, thank you.